Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Can I, uh, um, can I uh, start uh, the next uh, session, uh, please? Um, first of all, uh, welcome. It's, uh, it's the last day of uh, Davos. Uh, we're going to try to make this a, uh, a sparkly uh, and uh, a rapid fire session, and uh, hopefully also uh, invite uh, questions and, and discussion, uh, preferably uh, with the audience. So hereby, as you pick up uh, thoughts, have questions, have comments, uh, feel free uh, to interject uh, them. Uh, if not, uh, I'm sure this panel is capable of, uh, of continue, uh, continue to talk. First of all, let me introduce uh, uh, the people that are around me. Uh, uh, ladies first, still, if you don't mind, to the left of me, uh, Inga Bale, uh, who's the CEO of uh, Lloyd's of London, uh, as it's always a welcome. Uh, to uh, her uh, left uh, is um, Minister Pardan, with two very interesting uh, portfolios, as he explained uh, to me, energy and uh, skills and entrepreneurship uh, in India, and particularly the last one, um, uh, I think is very relevant for, uh, for this, uh, this discussion. To his uh, oppos opposite is our uh, good friend, uh, Tarek, who's a regular uh, visitor uh, of, uh, uh, of this, uh, of this uh, forum, um, heading in, uh, particularly in the Middle East, a uh, uh, logistics, can I still call it a startup? I think I can, uh, and otherwise uh, you you can correct me uh, you can correct me later on. And uh, to the very, to the to the right of me, uh, Gis Gilbert uh, Gilbert Ruhl, who's the CEO of Kluckner in uh, Germany, oh, startup too. Uh, not really. Not uh, really. 110 years ago. But. I think I think that I think that's old enough, isn't it? Yes. Um, so welcome. The topic of uh, of today, and uh, let me briefly set the scene, and then I will ask. Uh, the panelists uh, to inject that, is called From Linear to Exponential Value Change. That, that's a bit of corporate speak, so let me try to translate that and put it in, in perspective, uh, if, you, if, you, if, you don't, if you don't mind. Um, now, first of all, it starts from technology, as this whole week in Davos has been dominated by, by, by technology. The impact of technology is not what it always has been. It has become truly revolutionary, and it has truly impacted every industry and every part of society, and human beings, and even our biology. It's really pervasive, is the word, or revolutionary. Those are words that I think are proper to use in this case. Um, and what has happened a few years ago, or let's say 10 years ago, um, when you talked about the technologies that we're, that we're, that we're talking about, uh, AI and the internet, the impact was typically still involving consumer, the end consumer. It was a consumption element, and it typically involved startups. And we all know the companies that have brought them uh, to bear, the, the Facebooks uh, of, uh, of the world. What has now happened over the last years, and that the impact is really, I think, still only hardly understood. It has moved to the heart of the company, I've called that. The, in, the internet is beginning to affect value chains, companies, uh, how companies produce, where they produce it. Countries are becoming increasingly impacted uh, by that. So the technological revolution from a consumer product, from a gadget, if you could call that, often involving startups, affects now the heart of the company and is beginning to affect established uh, companies in every, in every industry. Um, the technologies that we're talking about is a wide range. Uh, yes, everyone this week talks about AI, about artificial intelligence, which is a very, very large one, and the impact is, is progressing dramatically fast, but it's certainly not the only one. Robotics is increasing dramatically. Over the next two years, robotics is forecasted to double uh, with an impact that we only are beginning uh, to, uh, to imagine. IoT, 3D printing, is beginning to uh, allow uh, that, that production it does not have to take place at one central large plant anymore, but can be, uh, can be localized uh, with everything involved there. Wearables, blockchain, uh, a massive impact. I can go on and on and on. The importance is all these technologies um, take place more or less at the same time and have a converging effect. The reason that we talk about the fourth industrial revolution. It's running very fast and it's not allowing any country and any individual and any company to sit still and to plan for it. It is largely, it's difficult to plan for this. And it's partly why, why we talk about it this week. And therefore, you need to think about it in a different way. Now, it's changing value chains. Value chains, so you first have to design a product. Then you need to buy the components of it. You need to manufacture it. You need to distribute it. And then finally, you need to sell it to the final consumer. Typically, 
I'm generalizing, typically were linear in the sense they were largely vertically integrated within, within a company. Most companies vertically integrated these functions because it allowed for scale. For those of you that want to read up to the theory, uh, there was a, a great British, actually, uh, economist, Ronald Coase, in 1937 already, who wrote that the size of a company, of an enterprise, is determined by the transaction cost. And by the way, he got a Nobel Prize in the late 90s of that, and there was a good reason for it, because the internet has the big impact of the internet is that it lowers transaction costs and it increases transparency. And that's precisely what's happening to value chains. Value chains are breaking up, like Lego blocks almost, and can be rearranged with dramatically improved transparency and dramatically um, improved uh, connect connectivity. Um, different scale is beginning to emerge. Uh, for those of you uh, that uh, were able to read last week's Economist, uh, it started to talk about the increasing scale of Facebook, of Amazon, and companies like that. And increasingly, some governments, some people are beginning to challenge that. Where the truth is in that, we will, we will see. Uh, but new scale elements are beginning, uh, beginning uh, to, uh, to, to emerge. So instead of a linear value chain, we have more value networks or exponential value chains, if you want to call that. That is what's taking place with platform economics, with AI on top of that, et cetera, et cetera. Now, is it good or bad? As always uh, in life, I suppose it's a bit of both. It's, first of all, largely a good thing. Consumer value is dramatically improving. You can now order something and often get it delivered at the same time. Uh, years ago, it was impossible. You, uh, we, we regularly all offer uh, on our uh, phones uh, to Google where we are, so we can find a way. And we think that's a good, uh, that's a good, uh, good trade-off. So consumer value has dramatically improved, and that's what's driving a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of this. Um, and I think we've only been still at the start of that. I think there's a lot more to come going forward. Um, it allows startups to you know, come from nowhere and to really grow. It allows innovation. It allows new countries uh, to develop. So it's largely a good thing. But there are clearly also derailers and warning signs, including this article in, uh, in The Economist about new monopolies that we need to be careful about. Uh, cybersecurity is obviously a danger if everything is connected everywhere. You really need to think, uh, think that through, uh, what the dangers are. Uh, jobs is a big, uh, big topic, certainly, uh, this week, and I think, I think rightly so. So that is the reason that we're talking about it here. That's why it's a topic uh, for Davos, and that's what I would like to explore with the, all of you in the audience and with this, uh, with, this, uh, with this panel. So first of all, I would like to start with technology, if that's OK. Um, what do you see are the biggest Impacts. What are the most impactful technologies in your industry uh, that you that you that you see around? Tarek, could could I start with uh, with you on this? Um, for me, it's an easy one. I, I think digit digitization is uh, is going to uh, fundamentally change the way uh, supply chains uh, uh, work. And and the reason I, I picked digi digitization is because um, there's so little of it around. If you look at the way um, um, trade works today, a lot of it is manual, um, whether it's in the private sector sphere or in the sphere of, of governments. Um, there's too many processes that are offline. And I think that's the first order of, of benefit. And to the extent that we can um, improve the level of, of, of technology in that area, I think we'll dramatically reduce uh, transaction costs and we'll enable the SME segments around the world, which is going to be really important to um, getting a political, uh, favorable political dialogue around these new technologies. Yeah. Inga, to the left, what are, what are the, what is, what is impactful for Lloyds of London and for your customers, by the way? Yeah, so um, Lloyds of London, Definitely not a startup. 329 no. years old this year, um, and a very. Uh, we do lots of complex insurance, so our customer base are, the, are businesses fundamentally, and of course their business models are being transformed with technology. That means our products have to transform to fit them. But for our own business model, the technology is apps. It's changing dramatically. We have an incredibly manual process that is all paper-based. We have a trading environment that's very physical with 4,000 people coming together in a one big trading room and doing business with paper. 
And that's got to stop. So we've got a massive modernization program, digitizing all of that. But the important thing is then the AI you can apply when it gets digital. So suddenly the, the experts, the technicians, the technical experts who have been sitting there, and a lot of what they do is in their brain, and as they're assessing risks, pricing it, we're going to start using computers to do that. And even though it's highly complex, the computer won't forget. So once the computer has looked at thousands and thousands and thousands of risks, it will remember every single factor. It'll know what's good, what's bad, and what to look out for. So we will start using artificial intelligence much more in that sphere. But the next thing we're looking at is using blockchain technology, and that's for the transparency thing. You mentioned earlier about this will lead to much more transparency, and that's got to be good for the customer. Right now, a customer, if something goes wrong, they need money. They need to be paid. They've hurt. They've hurt. Something's hurt. Something's been lost. Something's been damaged. They have no idea where that is in a process. So using blockchain technology, we're hoping, is then going to have one place for everyone to look at. They've submitted some documents, some claims, something to us, and everybody can track it through the process. So that's going to be our next big investment, and that's happening this year. Minister. Um, <coughs> In India is in many ways still a developing uh, country. It's a very large uh, uh, company. And if you look at the typical rankings that we always see uh, every year, in terms of technology, it's, it's not at the level of the Koreas and the, and the Japan, but it's rapidly, rapidly changing. What do you see as, as, the, as the technologies that will have the biggest impact on, on growth in India and also on the way society develops? See, we have a... Uh we are a developing country, rightly you have mentioned. Yeah. We are a developing country. We have a, we have, our challenges are multidimensional. Yeah. We have to adopt technology very fast. We have to implement and percolate the technology for convenience in the society in a big way. Mm. I, if I can cite two two statistics in India, we are very fast adopting new technology, and our base is increasing. <laughs> Ours is a 1.3 billion country. <clears throat> Out of that, now my mobile number is, mobile connection is more than a billion. 30%, 35% of that mobile network is now connected with internet. Yeah. Internet is fast emerging. Enter India is now connected with 4G. We're using 5G in a pilot basis. And now, very soon, we'll be converting it up to 5G. We have a unique identity number of near total of the population. Recently, in one of the welfare scheme, Prime Minister Modi initiated one scheme, we have to open, we have to bank the unbankable. In the short span of one and a half year, we could open more than 300 million new bank accounts. We could only achieve using this technology route this is our experience, this is our practice of linear to exponential growth. Mm. In every aspect, India is an aspiring country, India is a country of young population. In a short span, in the first, second, third industrial evolution, we could not match. But as you said, industrial evolution 4.0 is not going to make anybody sit ideal. Yeah. So India doesn't want to miss the bus also. Using technology, adopting technology, for financial growth, for developmental project, for healthcare, for education, the, in, the ministry I'm in charge skilling. We are using this method of technology adoption and make it scalable and have a positive impact in a short span. This is our practice. Yeah. Thank you very much. Gilbert, finally you. Um, Klickner. Yeah, concerning uh, technologies, uh, so maybe not platforms yet, but technologies. Yeah. I would say uh, um, artificial intelligence and machine learning has definitely the biggest impact yeah. currently because impacts, it, this impacts also all the technologies you mentioned. Yeah. It impacts robotics, 3D printing. This is all based uh, on uh, artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning. And the, the impact of corporates will be uh, uh, very significant. Now, so we expect within our company that more than 50% 
of, uh, for instance, of the repetitive work will fall apart with uh, artificial, in, uh, artificial intelligence. Now, so we, we already implemented, for instance, artificial intelligence for IT administration. So we de don't need any IT administrators more. And, and, and this goes, goes uh, uh, con through the corporate. And uh, also then in terms of Predict, predictions, predictive sales and all this. So this is all based on uh, artificial intelligence and also platforms uh, uh, to a significant uh, part and uh, also when we're talking about the big ones, uh, the, uh, one, one, the, the most uh, important basic technology is in my point of view, yeah, artificial intelligence, machine learning. Going forward, it could be blockchain, but not for everything. I think so here also in Davos so blockchain is uh, I would say the buzzword of, mm. of, of, uh, and and um, and uh, what I learned so it's good to come to Davos what I learned here um, is uh, that blockchain really doesn't work for everything uh, so we, we 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 for instance and we may come back later to this are all uh, initi have initiated a platform for the steel and metals industry and we're thinking also about a blockchain technology for this platform, but if this is the right technology, we don't know yet. Mm -hmm. and At least we have a better understanding about what it is now. Yeah. You know, because I think one of the one of the things about blockchain is that when we were talking about it a year ago, we didn't quite nearly, we didn't really understand it, did we? And I think at least we're moving on because a lot of these technologies, they are difficult to understand and, yeah. and we need to, particularly if they're going to interact with our customers, yeah. our customers have got to understand when it. You have for, uh, make it. When you have a, a data uh, where, which has to be changed, for in, instance, then blockchain doesn't make sense. You know? So they, it's, it doesn't work for everything. And, and I have the feeling here now that everyone wants to move uh, to blockchain, but this will also not work probably. Uh, no. But the biggest one for you is AI, and, yeah. and AI is developing now. It's not something over uh, five or uh, ten years. That's a clear message I, uh, I have uh, yeah. this, uh, this week, yeah. too. Would yeah. you agree? Yeah, I would agree. Unfortunately, uh, in, uh, uh, primarily in the US and in, yeah. uh, in, uh, in China. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. The, uh, also our uh, AI technology comes, you know, in this case, from, uh, from the US. And, uh, and, but, but, yeah. I, yeah. Can we briefly pick up on that? And particularly, I would like to ask uh, the minister uh, the question. Uh, it, it, is, it is clear that all these technologies are highly unequally divided. Let's put it that way. Uh, I think something like 70% of all robots are in five countries, and it's the usual suspects. It's Germany, South Korea, Japan, uh, US, and, um, and, and all the rest of the technologies, highly in, unequally divided. So not only within the society, but also between, between, between countries. Minister, uh, that must concern you. Uh, how, how do you bridge that, you, uh, you think? You see, it was, uh, if, I, if I equate with one example, Mm. Few years back, uh, with basic mobile phone was a rare commodity in Indian society, in Indian yeah. economy. When the base, the pyramid will increase, the pyramid will be strong. Yeah. The base of the pyramid will be strong. Then the challenge of adaptability of technology also reduce, also it will be cost effective. Few years back, the cost we have to pay for per unit cost in mobile. Mm. Well, that, that was the primary reason mobile became the status symbol. It's a, a commodity of allied. Mm -hmm. Now, when I'm talking about a 1 billion mobile users are there in India, that means entire society, a sizable section of society is adopting technology because it is creating convenience, it, it is creating value, yeah. it is creating, it, it has its economic impact. Yeah. Yes, today, some of the, today I, I visited uh, Microsoft's uh, uh, hologram uh, virtual classrooms. Yeah. Yes. It's very interesting. Yeah. Today it is costly. Today it is costly. It has to be, cost has to reduce. It can be scalable. And uh, basic nature of the society to adopt new things in the shorter span. Now the developed country has to, if, if, if it is economic proposition for them also, if they want to have a bigger market, they have to create a business model, how it can go to developing countries, how it can be cost effective, how it can be regional language based. Then only artificial intelligence will be much more useful for me if it will convert to my language. Right. So these are the challenges, some of the major challenges in front of this industry. I want to jump a bit on, 
on, <coughs> on upsides, downsides, and derailers, and winners and losers. And uh, not just because that's, that's provocative, but it's, I think it's important to understand that. Uh, Tarek, you, you, you are a startup. You, you are a challenger. Um, you compete with many established uh, players. Uh, can, can, you, can you elaborate a bit on that? Well, we're a startup that's in 100 countries. And yeah. so I think it's important to, to preserve the culture of a startup even when you start uh, growing. And uh, I think when we look at this, um, this, this paradigm, um, it's clear that there's a $2.4 billion, a trillion dollar, um, uh, uh, I would say, benefit from these technologies when you me when measure in terms of social impact and economic impact. The, uh, and, and those are coming in two areas. One is in the area of the environment. Um, uh, and, and I think it's important that we, 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 we recognize the fact that 50% of trucks are basically coming back uh, on empty, empty legs. And um, there's technologies that are out there now that you know, we're investing in that are improving this uh, situation uh, 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 dramatically. Um, so um, the, one of the, I think, big, um, you know, the other benefit is the, are the SMEs. And I think we need to talk about how we make sure this benefit um, is going in an equal way to the SMEs. And one of the ways we got into trouble with the WTO in the past is that, is that most people um, believed that the WTO was about big business. And when you see that nine out of the 10 new jobs in the emerging markets are coming from the SME segment, yeah. and 95% um, of all businesses are in the SME segment, um, we need to do what the SME segment really needs, and that means to make um, the the trade much more efficient and easier to, to conduct. Yeah. What, what, what are the winners and losers in your industry? Yeah, and our, so we are a steel and metals distributor. Mm -hmm. yeah, so we buying principal steel from the big uh, steel producers and then we distributing this to all kind of steel users, small craftsmen, uh, from small craftsmen to automotive. So what will happen in our industry, and this will happen probably also in more or less all industries, uh, we will have this kind of platforms going forward. And, uh, but what these platforms are doing, these platforms are moving themselves between the producer and the customer, and uh, they are not moving it. So the, the producer loses, if you like, the, the customer, but not only the customer, it also takes uh, um, a significant share of the margin. And, and this, by the way, the, and, and what are you doing now as, a, as, a, as an incumbent yeah. uh, when you know uh, this is going to happen uh, going forward? We started with uh, digitalization uh, four years ago. So we, we uh, were setting up our own hub in Berlin and we have meanwhile there are 85 digital natives and we produced a lot of so far proprietary platforms. And, but but uh, finally, it has to be an open platform. Uh, finally, this works only when uh, also competitors can join the platform. Um, and this is the reason why we, why we uh, uh, um, launched now a separate venture, which we will finance, by the way, by, with, uh, uh, with networking capital, and where Klöckner will, uh, uh, will end up in a minority position so that we cannot dominate this company. Because when, you, when we would dominate this, we would not, uh, lose, we would not uh, make sure that competitors come in on the platform. And, uh, but this is then uh, also finally disruptive to our own business because this will then cannibalize our own business. And the question now is well, what happens going forward when it works, when, platform, uh, when, when pl platforms are successful and, and platforms are only successful finally, I would say, when the platform is dominating. Yeah, um, yeah then the, also the value no? will, uh, yeah. uh, will move from, from the physical business, in this case, probably to this uh, platform company. Yeah, and I, w I want to come back on that uh, later, yeah. uh, by, by the way. Uh, indeed, uh, in theory, the most successful business model is a, is a monopoly uh, in the end. Uh, no, everything, everything is, er, nothing is stopped. That's where, uh, that's where it often tends to move to. But I want to, I want to come back on that because that's, a, that's indeed a very topical. I first want to continue on, on, on winners and losers and, and derailers. Inga, you, um, uh, you're, in the, you're in the trust business, I think. Um, um, and uh, and you you mentioned uh, you mentioned cybersecurity, uh, and um, and that brings it back to to trust. Can, can you elaborate on that? Yeah. So 
because of everything being connected yeah. and um, a lot of things now being stored in the cloud, yeah. one of the big things we're concerned about is something happening to that and disrupting that. And we are, Lloyd's is the largest insurer of cyber insurance. And many businesses, although predominantly in North America at the moment, are buying insurance against cyber attacks. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing that we've just, we've just done a piece of research actually, which looks at how dependent a lot of businesses are on these cloud providers. And we've done an analysis in just in the US alone, if one of the top three cloud providers fails, or they're hacked, something happens, mm -hmm. and their service is down for three to six days, which is perfectly feasible, mm -hmm. um, that would affect 12.4 million businesses in the US alone and could rise, um, give rise to $15 billion of economic loss. That's one cloud provider. And that just goes to show how when people think of their suppliers and, and you're talking about a monopoly, I would dread to think that there would be a cloud provider monopoly because already <laughs> there's a high, high concentration in very few cloud providers. And that's what technology is doing. It's, it's bringing new risks that we no. never used to have in our, in our supply chains before. So you still insure against those risks? We do. <laughs> <laughs> and there have been some more high profile cyber attacks. Um, and we, the, the cyber insurance demand is expected to grow exponentially yeah, yeah, because right. as, as it spreads out across the world and particularly regulation, which has a big influence on this, um, creeps out around the world, you'll see, we, we expecting to see a threefold increase just in the next two, two to three years. Yeah, so you, you would argue for regu more regulation on that, on that point? I think there needs I to be you. some regulation around cyber and the internet in total. I think yeah. there, um, it's going, no one's really taking ownership for it. Mm. And every business, so our business is highly regulated, banking, insurance, highly regulated. But because we've got technology happening all around it, the regulators look on and they don't know well, I don't really regulate that piece, but it has a big influence on the customer. Yeah. How do we get our arms around this? Who is going to be regulating this, this web that we all rely on? So right. I think something right. needs to be done about that. Minister Zev, yes, do you want to pick it up? Uh, yeah, only one way. So the winner, you asked about the winner. Yeah, the winner yeah. is the, the platform yeah. uh, orchestrator, platform uh, provider. This is the winner. And, and we have seen this in, in B2C, and we probably will see this also in, in B2B. Yeah, yeah. Minister, have you started to look at, at regulatory aspects uh, on, on, on this, or is, or is that...? I would like to answer the part one, and then we'll come to the regulatory one. Mm. The winner is society, the winner is system. There is no loser, there are challenges. Mm. Here lies the role of regulator. Mm. This is a new area. Startups are coming up with new solutions, innovative solutions. Mm. They're scaling up. In, in the uh, old days, we never thought this can be scalable in the, such a big way. We, uh, my friend Esa told, now these companies working in 100 countries. There are 100 domestic laws are there involving the same product. Yeah. So there must be some inter international regulation. Yeah. There must be some, and uh, this is a this is trust related issue. There must be some non-interfering regulation, self-guided regulation has to be there. Because this is breaking the, all the boundaries all the boundaries and their typical issues are there in the different part of globe. There must be some framework, some protocol, some self-guided protocol has to be there. Yeah, yeah. Tarek, yeah. Yeah, just going back to the SME, SMEs, I think one of the really challenging issues for them is that the, the, the trading environment is still complex. If you are an SME and you're shipping and you're, you're, you're looking at international trade, um, the customs rules and regulations are something that are, are not transparent to you. And so we can either sit around and wait for governments to fix those and digitize their own um, uh, supply chains, and, and, and we're working on a number of projects where they are, or you can use technology to take that complexity and simplify it for the SME. And it's one of the ways that we are responding to this. So you can take that complexity and, and put it in a transparent platform for SMEs and basically allow them to get more of a dividend from this from this, um, from this uh, trade and, uh, and this, th this potential. And I think one of, the, again, the big risks, and we talk about whether the, we're going to be creating more monopolies or where the value is going to, is if we don't 
look at those sorts of initiatives, then the value is going to be concentrated in larger companies. And I, I don't think we can afford that this time around. The reason that we're going down this path is we need to make this an inclusive opportunity for, for everyone. And, and the way to do that is by bringing the SMEs uh, along. Um, and I think it's a really important uh, uh, message. And that's one of the things that could derail the success of, uh, of the future of, of, of these uh, technologies. Yeah. Gilbert, you come from the country which is the champion of the Mittelstand, as it's called so now, nicely. Maybe not SMEs, but maybe MEs or whatever you want to call that. Um, um, how, is, how, is that in, how is that in Germany? That's, that's, a, that's a big debate, isn't it? This, the spread of technology and whether these, the, the, what made Germany, the German economy great over the last decades in many ways, whether all are participating with that. Can, can you comment on that? Yeah, yeah the, the, the problem going forward is, of course, when this platforms finally dominate mm. the market, then it's, it's of course, difficult for all these mid-sized companies to catch exactly. up. Exactly. You know? So they, they, already have, uh, they already have difficulties to catch up with the digitalization anyhow. But, but when they are then finally connected to all kinds of platforms, and, uh, uh, then, and, and, and when the value uh, is really, or, or the, the margin is then uh, moving to the platform, then they're getting difficulties. And, and these platforms yeah, finally have to be big. So have to be big. Uh, and, 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 and every platform tries to dominate uh, the market. Now, so we have seen this in B2C, and we will see this also in B2B. For instance, in our industry, it wouldn't make sense to have five platforms. And then also the convenience for the customer is no more there. The, yeah. the convenience is there when there, when there is one, uh, also, uh, when there is one access, when there is one interface to one, uh, to one uh, platform. So there could, this could be uh, challenging going forward for these uh, companies. Okay. Minister, can you, can you comment on that? Monopolies and platforms uh, in India, are you, are, you, are you afraid of that? Is that too early? No, uh, no. we're not afraid of that. Uh. We, uh, we feel the more, more company and those who are already there, because recently India is debating on one issue that's also now is in front of judiciary. When we develop the unique identity number, UID, this is data. Mm. How do we use that? Some companies are using, payment banks are using that. Some consumer durables companies are using that. When they are using all these data, sometime some overlapping, some exits are there. Some kind of little bit monopolies are there, but society, finally, that product is available in different platform also. That creates an internal competition. I don't see any, because technology is not a single window affair. It's a, it's a multi-dimensional, it's a multi-window. Mm. If I'm not satisfied with this product or this platform, mm. I may, I may, that because fair competitions are emerging, new startups are com coming up mm. with a higher version. So I don't see what, with our, our experience, I don't see monopoly will be a challenge, but regulation has to be there. Yeah. But that regulation often comes too late. You know, there's a problem because the technology is changing so fast. Yes. And whenever that's the regulation that's is that's there, it's too late anyhow. That's the right? dynamic. So that's yeah. why I say this is self-derived regulation has to be there. Some code of conduct has to be there. It's a very yeah. dynamic. But the, the only thing with that is that if there's existing regulation that limits using it, and one example we have, I mean... That's the concern. We're the largest insurer of shipping around the world. And, of course, on, autonomous ships are basically there. They're ready. They can go. Yeah. But yeah. ports can't take them because of the regulation around controlling port areas. So they can't take it into their own hands, or the shipping sector can't because they physically won't be able to take their ships in, they won't be allowed to because of the existing regulation, and it's, and it's slowing down progress. Yeah. Yeah. Can, can we think here, blockchain can be our use? Can we put some of the transparent information in the blockchain? Mm. So people will interact, people will know, there will be self-accounting, self-certification will be there. Yes, regular, here, can't, we should not use regulation. We should use code of conduct. Some self-declared code of conduct should be there. It should not be restrictive. Then any regulation, any restriction is detrimental for technology. Yes. So your point is, regulation is always has a certain time lag by definition. So use use codes or use other means to basically uh, have something in the short term. Yes. Uh, you're laughing, uh, Inga. No, I just I just <laughs> think it's at the moment it seems to be holding certain 
yeah. certain areas yeah. back, that's yeah. all, because there is existing regulation. If it's brand something brand new that doesn't have regulation, yeah. of course it's you know it's it's moving ahead quickly. But existing old industries, I think, are being I, I, held I can back. I one example. Please. It's in brand new. Recently, seaplane came to India. Till now, we don't have any idea of seaplane. We don't have any regulation. How do we do that? So no, no, no. Usual government, how do a government behave? No, we don't have a written information, written documentation. There is no. It should not be. Technology is the, technology will be, who is the sufferer? Mm. Sufferer is the poorest of the poor, greater society. Mm. He should not be devoured from the technology development of industrial evolution 4.0. Mm. Mm. This community has to find out some way. What are they? Yeah. I mean, there are even, so, so I just want to say, no, so in insurance, and we're very global, there are some countries that demand a paper insurance policy. You go to China, they've got millions and millions of consumers buying insurance on their mobile device. And yet yes. some countries, because they, they're established, insist on paper. And that's where it, can, that's where it slows down um, progress for some, some, some parts of the world. So I think this is where there's a little bit of a, a, a disconnect. If you were to, we, we did a survey of SMEs. 86% um, say that technology levels the playing field for them. So they perceive technology as being an enabler for their business. And the statistics show that 100% of technology-enabled SMEs actually export. So I think the biggest problem that we have is that when we talk about regulation, the regulations that we have are actually impeding mm. the development. Uh, and and if, you take, if you look at Europe, for example, the, um, the laws about the protection of data, et cetera, it's no uh, accident that the majority of the successful companies are coming out of the US and China because they don't have those same restrictions. So we have to look at the, the, the we have to look at minimizing regulations and look, at, look about talk about empowering these technologies because the future, whether we like it or not, you're not going to be able to regulate away the, the, the development that's taking place. It's just inevitable. It's happening. We need to be part of the, the future. Enabler. I, I have a quick look around. I want to make sure that we recognize uh, the audience. Are, are there any uh, people in the audience that, that have a question to the panel? If not, I continue. Uh, there's a question right behind me. Please go ahead. Maybe we can have a mic. You can say who you are and where you're from, please. I'm Arun Sharma. I'm a member in the Adani Group uh, Board in Australia, and I'm also a Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research at Queensland University of Technology. Your question about blockchain, it is not suitable if you change your data very frequently, but it is suitable if you care about the history of the change, who made yeah. change when. That's very important. Anyway, the question I'm talking about is, we are focusing on AI, robotics, and everything. Yeah. And uh, you did mention uh, 3D printing. In some ways, for the discussion we are having among the value chain, if 3D printing technology really takes off, and if you look at companies like HP Inc., who, who are betting the farm on manufacturing, basically moving to 3D printing. So in a way, you can look at manufacturers as the ultimate middlemen. And so the consequence of value chain, 3D printer manufacturers, they will make money, but there will be competition. So everyone is trying to manufacture things locally. The value then shifts to the designers who, whose design is being used. And you can use blockchain to put a digital signature every time the 3D printer prints, and the value shifts to the designer. But the value also shifts to the countries that produce resources if they have the wherewithal to reduce their power cost so that you can make powders and ship it, and shipping powders is a lot cheaper than shipping finished goods or raw materials. The consequence for insurance companies is that container shipping will go down and bulk shipping will go up. And this is a profound shift over the last two centuries. Manufacturing has become this day. And we have been thinking about disintermediation in the digital world. The physical manufacturing world might be completely changed. And that might be even more profound for value chains than we think about. That is a, that is a fantastic provocative uh, question. Thank you very much. By the way, if, if for those of you that know companies like Maersk, uh, they would uh, confirm that already. Uh, uh, and the reason is the world where you know, a lot of manufacturing is done, for instance, in China, and for instance, on, based on low labor cost, is rapidly, uh, uh, rapidly, uh, rapidly uh, shifting.
Um, and Tarek, can you can you pick up uh, that, uh, that 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 question? Are we how rapidly are we moving to a world where where production will be more reshort, reshort, uh, near short, uh, much more local, much more uh, small, and uh, completely you know changing what you what you produce and particularly what you distribute in between? Yeah, we're there already. I mean, yeah. if you if you look at the way that container. Um, traffic has been stagnant in the last few years. I think one of the big drivers of that is some of these um, these actions taking place. So I think, you know, Marsh knows that, we know that. Yeah. And, um, but I do think uh, um, going forward, um, when you look at technologies like uh, blockchain, um, we have to think really carefully about why the problem exists in the first place. So if, if one of the benefits of blockchain is transparency, well, there's many um, aspects of competition between countries, the way customs organizations work that don't necessarily want that transparency of information between organizations. So we, we have to really look fundamentally at why the problem exists before we can start looking at technologies. A good example of where blockchain could be helpful is in the area of payments. Yeah. So um, if, you were, if you were to um, try to transfer money into to Africa, oftentimes uh, the cost can be up to 12 percent of, of the transfer. But there are services out there that use blockchain to do that same transaction for 2%. So that's a real enabling way to, to enable trade, to enable um, uh, money transfer. That blockchain, you're not speculating where you're speculating for half an hour, but you're not really speculating in the way that a lot of us are starting to think about blockchain. But that could be a real enabler for SMEs, especially in the emerging markets. I just wanted to also yes, sorry, ahead, pick up please. on the um, aspect about the manufacturing impact. Of course, it's also going to have a huge impact on services. Yeah. A lot of people offshore, they had call centers and humans, of course, in other countries providing that advice. That's all going to chatbots and robo-advisors now. Yeah. And, and so that's going to have a huge impact on some of those countries as well, just, not just the physical manufacturing, but also this service community. Uh, service. There's, there's a question there right behind you. Uh, yes, of course. I would like to build on what was just said. Uh, because I'm from Dassault System, we provide platforms for uh, almost all airplane manufacturers. Everything you flew is designed, simulated with our software. I want to uh, uh, comment on what Boeing announced six months ago because I think it's a very profound uh, story. They have announced that they will digitally control all suppliers end to end under digital IP. Uh, that the uh, way they buy will change and they were going to move from supply to value to value to value network. The consequences are significant because uh, basically what is going to happen is they are going to use the platform um, to control spare plot services. Um, so the platform can be good for companies. And more than that, they are going to trade uh, in the supply by comparing the cost internally with what can be printed by someone else real time and they will be able to track the cost and produce as close as possible where the spare parts are needed. So I believe that it's much more than digitalization supply chain. It's really the digital asset becoming the value and therefore being produced wherever it has to be produced because this is changing and, all the ecosystem. And, if I may add, and heavily impacting the competitive dynamics as well. Uh, it is uh, at a point where the robotization, for example, is at such a level that a plan can be built in the, in the countries of the world without losing any IP uh, because the robots does the job and it's difficult to understand how the robots work. Yeah, and on the, um, the, we've done analysis on the intangible nature of assets these days. And if you look at the S&P 500, uh, you know, a few decades ago, it was made up of fundamentally sort of 85% tangible assets, 15% intangible. That's completely reversed now. 85% of the S&P 500 assets are intangible. In other words, data, something we can't get our hands on. Yeah. Um, there are many questions. Uh, who is uh, who is uh, first? Did you keep track? Okay, go ahead. I guess along the same uh, line of thought, uh, my question is about the the, the title of this session. Uh, you know, exponential supply chains. Um, I would I would like to 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 get your views on on the word chains 
because I think, in fact, we're more talking about networks, webs, uh, complete um, change of, um, of players and, and so on. So your view on that one. Yeah, but you, yeah. you want to take that? Are we moving from change to, to yeah, networks? Yeah, of or? course, to networks. So uh, a platform is orchestrating a network and not, not, not a chain. Yeah? So uh, in our case, for instance, producers, distributors, service centers, customers, they're all connected uh, in the platform. So it's clearly, it's clearly not a, change, uh, a chain anymore. And I think that's going to mean everything's much more flexible and modular, so you can take things out much more easily without breaking a chain in the old way. Well, that, that's the, I used the, the example of Lego blocks a little mm. bit, um, because in a search for an analogy, mm. um, where, uh, well, we often go, go back to our childhood, maybe, maybe we, we should, uh, and uh, it can be mm. reconfigured constantly with both advantages and disadvantages, mm. uh, particularly competitively, I would, I would argue. Thank you for that. Next question. Um, my name is Andreas Ritschlik. I'm uh, with the German media company responsible for legal and compliance. I have a professional interest in re uh, regulation and I, I love this uh, discussion here because it shows there is a complaint on existing regulation saying it's slowing down, it's no longer adequate, it's preventing innovations, taking out speed. And on the other hand, everybody agrees that if, uh, let's say, if uh, Big Brother meet, meets Big Data, we need regulation and we have a monopolistic situation in many areas of our business when we talk to the european commission they are i would say they 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 capture what should be regulated in the business to consumer world but well, they have huge difficulties in understanding how regulation should look like in the business to business world and you mentioned for example in your industry now your focus single points of failure because the concentration is so high in the cloud business what is the kind of regulation in these business-to-business -business areas which should be adapted? Um, and I wonder who is making these proposals. Politicians are not able to. They are in their perception uh, years behind. And, and uh, because, uh, so, so the question, how could we organize a process of coming up with the right proposals for the right uh, regulation? Then one final remark, if I talk to, to US executives, they say don't wait for the US. They will be the last to come up with regulation proposals. So the Western internet and the Western uh, style of dealing with artificial intelligence has to be regulated in Brussels. So uh, that's a great question. Thank you for that. And we'll go to the next one in, in a sec. I need to defend the regulator here for a sec. The technology is developing so rapidly. Um, even young startups are, are, are grappling and are, are fighting with following that, uh, and let alone established companies and let alone regulators and people in government. So it, it is extraordinarily hard. Uh, uh, um, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try, of course, which I think is what your argument is. Tarek, you yeah, want to comment on that? This is, this is a great question, because yeah. if you look at how these trade agreements are done and who is negotiating them, yes. they, they tend to be older, um, trade-oriented professionals. And there's nowhere in that dialogue where you have guys that are experts in blockchain or in the new emerging technologies. So we need those discussions with the regulators to involve these younger emerging technologies. And there's no place for them um, to actually do that in the way that we've set up international trade. So I think one of the ways that we get around, we, we kind of, we, we want to regulate but we don't want to impede. The one of the ways we do that is by engaging the right experts in those discussions, and they're not the same experts of the past. Yeah. Uh, it was very interesting this week, Ma uh, Macron was arguing to make uh, the institutions better, uh, if I can paraphrase it like that. So that's one way of doing it, upgrade the regulators. Uh, the other ones is, I've heard from some of my American uh, friends that have more or less given up, and they look for different ways of, of doing that. Not quite sure what it is, though, but um, there's a next question there. Um, hi, I'm a business school professor, so I've got some different points of view. I'll be very quick. Um, we need regulation when markets fail. At least that's the theory I subscribe to. Not everybody subscribes to it. And so I'm not sure yet that we know that the markets have already failed and we're already asking for regulation. So it'd be nice to first point out where have the markets failed. So for example, your situation where you cannot take an autonomous, autonomous ship into port is a good example of a market failure. And now we need to figure out how can we overcome this market failure. Regulation may not be the only way, certainly worth looking at it, but are there other uh, solutions to market failure is something that I would like to suggest. The second thing I'd like to uh, pick up on is your introduction to um, the value chain. You kind of stopped at sales. I'd like to go to service and uh, customer service, of yeah. course, which I'm sure is inadvertent on your part, yeah. uh, and then returns. So I have not yet come across HP making a 3D disintegrator. 
So those empty trucks are going to have to bring back stuff that needs to go back for recycling. Talking about recycling and renewal, there's now technology that takes old roads and reuses them in place. So you don't cart the old material away someplace and process them and bring it back. You process it on site. And if you look at the renewal that has to occur now in the war-torn areas, all of that concrete and steel can be processed on site. You don't have to take it away anywhere and bring it back. So there's another area in which I think um, the value chains will change. And as soon as Apple fixes my phone, uh, I can tell you my next point, which I have uh, forgotten, obviously. Um, I'm sure we can arrange that for <laughs> Apple. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. Um, OK. The, the last point I wanted to create, I wanted to mention was we haven't talked about skills development. Uh, the minister is in charge of skills, and I'm sure with the exponential growth of uh, the use of new technology, skills on both the part of the user yes. uh, as well as the producers have to grow exponentially. That's a great question. Can, can I um, uh, ask the minister to comment on, on skills, given, yeah, given yeah, that it's yeah, a huge yeah. part of your, your, this your is portfolio? This is a good suggestion. As I said, yeah, uh, we go. in yeah. India, what, what, what are you practicing? Uh, if I cite that example, in India, uh, our working population is 500 million. Hmm. We have to, to upskill them, reskill them. Otherwise, they'll be useless. How do you do that? Who are my product? Who are my commodity? Here, I have to use this technology route, to virtual classrooms, digital information, and upskilling, reskilling, and with a scale. I have only answered through this technology synergy. Mm. There's a question here. Yes, hello. Uh, I'm Tim Mowen, Chief Executive of the Global Reporting Initiative. Um, actually, in a previous role, I worked in a supply chain for Apple, so maybe I can help my colleague with his phone. Um, but some of my question actually goes to that. Now we're talking about digital technology uh, leading to the fourth industrial revolution, but we're still dealing with a lot of the problems of the third and maybe even the second industrial revolution. We have you know, forced labor at, at, at huge and growing rates. We have child labor. We have entire villages in Bangladesh that are now underwater. Um, so how can we use this digital technology to create a race to the top, to really address some of these, these lingering issues? That, that is a great question. And, uh, and, if, and if you don't mind, during this week, uh, there have been several sessions uh, on a web, initiative, uh, a web initiative called The Future of Production, uh, which is really w where, and it started last year, by the way, and uh, my company, AT Carney, has been lucky enough to be one of the partners in that, uh, where we started to look at what is these impact on, on, on production systems, where what is being made, and all the consequences of that. And by the way, uh, to, uh, to continue the point, the human skills and human resources were one of the biggest uh, topics, uh, topics around. But this year, uh, there has been work, and I would, I would recommend that you, all, that you all read that, on readiness of countries. And it was actually quite, quite startling. Perhaps not surprising if you think it through, but still startling if you look at that. We looked at 100 countries, so that's only half of the total countries uh, there is. And the vast majority, two thirds, were way behind. Uh, and we're, we're not even close. And indeed, to come to your point, we're still largely agricultural uh, economies and, and dealing with many different, uh, different, different aspects. And at the other end of the spectrum, you have the Koreas and the Japans and the Germanys and, and, and the United States that are um, beginning to move into you know, monopolies of platforms and these types of issues. So the distance between, between the two uh, has been has been has been extending, and uh, and one of the questions that comes up: uh, What do you do at the country level? What do governments do uh, to to basically stimulate that, to leap ahead, to leapfrog, uh, to perhaps not wait through the various stages of uh, development going forward? You want to pick that up? I am in charge of clean cooking fuel to our country. Mm. When we took charge, uh, we found there are a lot of ghost connections are there in the LPG through digitalization, through deduplication, th using technology, we could block some of the ghost consumer. Yeah. And secondly, in India, we subsidize the cooking fuel, LPG. Now what we decide, we'll give, we sell it in the market price, and we'll pass on the subsidy to his bank account. Recently, India is uh, presiding over the biggest ever DBT mechanism, network in our country, in the, in the world. Using digitalization, using technology, we can govern, you can speed up the governance, we can find out the, you can map the problem, 
With a fixed time in 2018, we have a plan to connect 40 million households with electrification. Mm. How can we do that? Unless until you, you, you use technology, we use digital network, we cannot do that. Exactly. Now, some, some of the perennial issues, some of the legacy issues of industrial revolution 1, 2, and 3, we have to address using this kind of innovative methodology. Maybe even this kind of con or this, uh, countries have a uh, better uh, opportunity to catch up, like a startup, because they don't have this path, they don't have all this regulation, but only, of course, with technology. Huh? I would say there's right. two sides to this coin. Um, I think um, SMEs are asymmetrically impacted by regulation. At the, on the other hand, the engines of growth are SMEs, so nine out of ten new jobs are coming from SMEs. So it's really, to me, obvious that we need to deregulate and reduce the amount of complexity in, um, in, in to get the benefit and the trade benefit and the dividend of this growth going forward. So all we really need to do is reduce the barriers, um, reduce the complexity, and the SMEs will take care of themselves. They'll be a natural beneficiary of this, of this growth. And it's the countries that have the most complexity that are actually diminishing the returns from growth uh, in the greatest way. So it's a pretty straightforward answer. Let's reduce the barriers, and, 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 and you know, everyone's going to enjoy this, uh, this next 10 years of growth. So we have room for one more uh, question, and then we're going to wrap it up. Uh, I just want to pick up on uh, Minister Pradhan's uh, thing about that we can't regulate everything right away. And there has to be a code of conduct. But how do you make code of conduct appear quickly enough? And one of the mechanisms to have code of conduct is actually to have a ranking of social responsibility in a particular domain. We know the pharmaceutical industry, the access scheme actually has worked. When you start producing list of pharmaceutical companies which are actually providing medicinal access, suddenly there is improvement in that. So what governments can do is encourage civil society to come up with rankings of social responsibility where that, that actually happens. Now, coming to the regulation thing, I actually also am worried about too, too much regulation too early. Uh, we had a discussion yesterday about um, uh, agile governance in the fourth industrial revolution. And right now, people are talking about big tech being tobacco. Uh, and most of the focus actually is not yet on robotics. It actually is on the big platform companies with two-sided markets that use our data to make huge profits. Now, obviously, European Commission has looked at privacy and use of data. But I think what we need to do is let the market decide and come up with mechanisms where we can monetize our data. There are technologies now emerging that actually allows that if a company uses my data to generate revenue, then I should get a micropayment of the revenue. And if they don't use it, then I don't get a micropayment. And that will force other market-oriented mechanisms to address it. So finding the right balance in regulation is going to be extremely important. Market has solutions, so is social responsibility. And I think we should do everything to encourage it. Right. I think there's work ahead uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of regulation. Um, I want to wrap things up with, with the panelists. So um, is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? What is your greatest hope? What is your greatest worry? You, you want to, who, who, wants, who wants to go first? Well, I think can, I, can I ask you? I think it's a first? good thing. It has to be a good thing. We've, we've got to keep moving on. Um, my biggest hope is that we'll get a better balance across the world in terms of um, this wealth because this you talked about trust. I think we've got a huge distrust yeah. from a lot of the people of big business. Yeah. And if it can le bring more levelling um, of that, then I think it's uh, something to be hopeful for. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. So also my point of view, uh, it's uh, no doubt about positive. Negative is, I think, that, that uh, governments uh, are too slow. Uh, so and they, 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 must, they have to move from debates to execution. And this is what I'm clearly missing, especially also in Europe. Yeah. Tarek. There's no debate here. 86% of small businesses say technology is an enabler. Yeah. And I think we, should, we need to just keep it at that. Yeah. It's inevitable. We can't escape. Right. It is, must come. It's a good thing. I would like to uh, hereby thank everyone. Uh, thank, first of all, the panelists. And thank everyone in the audience that have been so active uh, in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in this debate. There's clearly work ahead. I think that's all our conclusion. Uh, there's a lot still unknown, uh, but uh, we're, we're positive on the road ahead. Can I summarize the discussion this way? Thank you very much. Thank you.